A very, very warm welcome to you. I would like to do a little bit of a, a bit of a what? Uh, a bit of a, a, a biography on uh, a gentleman called Alfred Richard Orage. And he was a sort of central to the Gurdjieff work uh, from the early 20s to about 1930, 31. And he actually translated huge, huge sections of Beelzebub's tales from the original Arminian into English. And he was quite a, a sensational character, quite a, a remarkable man indeed. And he was born in a place called Dacre, D-A-C-R-E. And it's a little, a little village in North Yorkshire in the United Kingdom and it's very very close to a famous town called Harrogate and this is where a, a very very famous flower show well for at least people of the United Kingdom takes place annually the Harrogate flower show and about two three miles west of that is the very very tiny village of Haworth and in the center of Haworth there is a parsonage and it's where the Bronte sisters actually spent most of their lives, Charlotte, uh, Anne and Emily, in, the, in the, the parsonage at Haworth. So we have in North Yorkshire, it's at the top, more or less at the top of England, uh, just before one is heading into, into Scotland and so on. Uh, and we have in that little enclave, we have a, a background of great literary work, and genius who have actually been born there and actually produced great work over the last 100 and 150 years, whatever it is. And Orage's parents were academic, they were school teachers. And he, in the year 1903, he founded something, he founded something called the Leeds Art Club. And it was one of the most successful of its day. And if we were to jump, this he was uh, 30, 30 years of age when he did this. And four years later, in 1907, he founded something. Uh, in fact, he became the editor of something called the, uh, the New Age Arts Magazine. And that was one of the leading arts magazines of its generation. And it, attra it, attra it attracted such contributors as T.S. Eliot, and Ezra Pound, and, and T.S. Eliot went on to say that Alfred Richard Orage was the greatest editor of his day, and I'm, I'm sure that he was. Uh, Pound and Eliot came in touch with the fourth way, and they didn't really resonate to it, they continued with their poetry, but they delved, they did, they did Orage and, uh, sorry, Eliot and Pound, delved for a little while and in the year 1914 uh, whilst Orage had been editor for the New Age magazine for one year he, he actually met Uspensky and Uspensky was giving lectures at the, for the, the London Philosophical Society on, on his book uh, Fragments of an Unknown Teaching in Search of the Miraculous and Orage met Uspensky at one of these meetings. Later on, Uspensky introduced Orage to Maurice Nichol. And for a number of years, from 1914 until 1921, when Orage and Nichol actually met Gurdjieff at one of Gurdjieff's London lectures, they would all congregate of an evening in Maurice Nichol's central London house. And can you actually imagine the conversation? What it would be like, you've got P.D. Uspensky, who became the darling of London society with his first book, Tertium Organum, uh, the third canon of thought, uh, which propelled him into London society, and especially that of a lady called Lady Rothmere, who along with her husband owned most, owned most of the new newspapers in the United Kingdom. So in Morris Nichols' house, you've got Uspensky, you've got Orage, you've got Nichol, you've got Nichol's wife, 
and they're all sitting having dinner and drinking whatever they were drinking by candlelight and having these talks from like 10 o'clock in the evening, 10 o'clock in the evening to flat five o'clock in the morning. Can you imagine being a fly on the wall? What, what that must have been like, absolutely extraordinary. And in 1921, as I say, Orage met Uspensky in 1914. And seven years later in 1921, he met Gurdjieff. And like Nickel, Nickel sold his uh, medical practice to go and work at La Prairie in Fontainebleau. And Orage actually gave up, he sold the New Age magazine in 1921. And people couldn't believe it. They thought that he'd lost his mind, though they met it with amazement and with amusement that this highly successful editor of a great arts magazine had actually completely just sold it, forgotten all about it, and gone to Fontainebleau to be with uh, Mr. Gurdjieff, Monsieur Bonbon. And so Orage arrived in 1922, at the end of October, at La Prairie in Fontainebleau with Gurdjieff. And at the time, Gurdjieff's group, the Harmonious Development, the Institute for the Harmonious Development of Mankind, had become relatively well known. And the world's press or the world's media, which at that time would be very, very small considered to what it's like today, they actually descended uh, at, at Gurdjieff's Institute and they actually came into the grounds and Gurdjieff was in the garden and they said that's the man that's they referred to them as the, 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 the press and the media referred to Gurdjieff and his crew as the forest philosophers and the newspaper people said that's him let's go and have a talk with him and they wandered over with the cameras and the writing pads and so on and they said you're the great forest philosopher uh, Mr. George Gurdjieff, aren't you? And Gurdjieff acted superbly and he said, Me, no, 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 no. Me, just gardener. I, I dig you good ditch, make good coffee, make nice couscous in kitchen. Uh, me, gardener. Me, not right. Me, not understand you. Me, you from where? I not understand. I not understand. You want coffee, couscous. Couscous and coffee? And the media thought the man is a lunatic. So all the reports that were given to the media about the great forest philosopher were a load of bunkum in their eyes. And Gurdjieff, in this particular moment, uh, when he dealt with the media, exemplified the role of the sly man. Because the last thing he wanted, the last thing anyone would want, is the world's media intruding into something that was very, very sacred and very, very mystical, and very, very real. No, no, nobody would want that. So he got rid of them very, very successfully. After about a, less than a year, about 10 months with Gurdjieff, Gurdjieff said to Orage, I would like you to go to New York, and I would like you to teach, and I would like you to raise funds for the Institute. And Orage went, and he found a bookstore on 31st Street, which is just between Fifth Avenue and Broadway. And the bookshop is called The Sunwise Turn. And Mr. Orage from North Yorkshire in England became a bit of a celebrity with all the American intellectual people, especially the ladies. And he gave talks on a Saturday and on a Wednesday for up to three hours. And there'd be a question and answer session, a session afterwards. And the joint owner of the bookstore was a lady called Jessie Dwight. And Jessie Dwight and Orage fell in love with one another and they got married. And Gurdjieff was very, very much against this. He actually, he referred to, to Jessie Dwight. Let me look at my notes, please. And there's, there's, there's obviously loads of them. Uh, He referred to, Gurdjieff re referred to Orage's new wife as an American woman pampered out of all proportion to her position. Not a very nice thing to say, is it? 
It's not nice at all. But he said it, and it didn't deter Oraj, who actually went on to marry her, and they had two beautiful children, Richard and Anne. There's a thing that I've left out at the beginning, which I would like to add now, because a lot of people, well, a number of people, are speaking to me about Nietzsche, and he's the German philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche, and his search for higher, his quest for higher consciousness. And A.R. Orage, a number of years, before, about a decade, before he even met Uspensky, about 1904, 1905, he wrote a book called Nietzsche, The Dionysian Spirit of the Age. And this, this work by Orage is one of the major uh, guidebooks for Nietzsche's philosophy in the English language. And it's still used today and referred to. And the title is uh, Dionysus, uh, the Spirit of the Age. Nietzsche, Dionysus, the Spirit of the, uh, the Age. And Orage believed that, as I've just said, that, that Nietzsche's underlying quest was one for heightened consciousness, for an altered state of being, uh, which it was. And there's, there's a very, I've got a really, really creaky chair. I hope it's not coming through on the sound. It's like, ah, 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 ah. I must get some new chairs now as well. Uh, and there's a wonderful synchronicity with Orage and Nietzsche and with my own journey. For, for about seven years, Orage intensely studied Nietzsche <clears throat> before he met Uspensky. And seven years before I became involved in the work, and I was introduced to it, I also studied uh, Nietzsche for about seven years. And it's a very, 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 very strange uh, coincidence. And someone who's come through to me who I'm working with, uh, a gentleman from Germany, uh, who is very, very much into Nietzsche. So we, we can't, no matter what we do, we can't get rid of Nietzsche. He's there in the background all the time and a very, very beautiful, sublime writer as well. Uh, but Gurdjieff takes it one step further, obviously. Uh, let me look at my notes for a moment, please. So, at the Sunwise Turn bookstore, or Orage uh, taught from 1924 until 1931 for like a seven year period. And there was a massive, the work was going very, very smoothly. And Orage had actually uh, raised a considerable amount of money for, for Gurdjieff's Institute, which was very, very good for everyone involved. But in 1930, things seemingly took a turn for the worse. During the time from 1924 to 1931, every six months or so, Orage had gone back to Fontainebleau to spend time with Gurdjieff and to sort of catch up with him and so on, catch up with him and so on. And in 1930, Gurdjieff arrived in New York and he actually disposed Orage of his teaching and said, you under no circumstances are you to teach anymore because you're self-observing without the emphasis Gurdjieff believed was that Orage was self-observing without self-remembering. And he believed that you could self-observe without self-remembering and also with the inclusion of negative emotion. This was Gurdjieff's take on Orage's latter te teaching in New York. And Gurdjieff got everyone that Orage was working with to sign an oath saying we will never ever work with A.R. Orage again. And later, Gurdjieff found out that Orage had actually signed the oath himself. And Gurdjieff cried. Gurdjieff was in tears at the humility and the, the, the character of this man that he'd actually signed the oath, which was meant for other people to sign, saying that they wouldn't work with him. So he signed it, 
saying that he wouldn't work with himself. And in 1931, Orage came back to England and he continued the rest of his days, a number of years that he had left, <coughs> working in political, economic, science, which is quite, quite very, very hard to get one's head around, uh, that he'd been so involved with Gurdjieff, and he was instrumental in translating Beelzebub's tales from the Arminian into the English. He translated so, so much of it. And the first editions that were sent to Orage in New York uh, he said that he wrote back to Gurji, phoned him, whatever, and he said, I can't work with this. It's humanly impossible to understand. You totally, can you work on it a little bit more? And a year went by, Gurji revised it, and Orage got a, uh, the revision, and he said, it's absolutely perfect. I can actually work on this now, and we can actually go from here. So the last few years of Orage's time, with Gurdjieff was spent with Orage translating Beelzebub's tales. But it must have been a devastating blow to be told that the teaching that Orage was given uh, was out of line with the original teaching of Gurdjieff. And he possibly came back to England a broken man. Uh, there's some quotes I'd like to share with you from people who were close to him and what, what happened at the end. Okay, he died in uh, 1934 and he is actually buried at Highgate Cemetery, which is a, which is a very, very beautiful area of London. And not the cemetery, you don't, wouldn't really want to be in there, would you? Uh, but the cemetery is very, very famous and the, the commie bastard Karl Marx is buried in there. And I think Orage is quite a distance from him. Uh, but it's a very, very famous cemetery with very, very famous people in there. And Orage is buried in there. And on his tombstone, there is an enneagram. And there's a very, very beautiful quote, which is Krishna's words to Arjuna in the Bhagavad Gita. This is on the tombstone of A.R. Oraj. And I can't remember it off by heart because I've only done uh, the revision for this work a few hours ago and the quote on A.R. Oraj's tombstone from the Bhagavad Gita is as follows and in a way it sums up the work and it's very 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 beautiful and it gives succor amidst any anxiety that one may have if you can grasp it and you can really believe it quote you grieve for those you should not grieve for the wise neither grieve for the living nor the dead. Never at any time was I not, nor you, nor the princes of men, nor shall we cease to be hereafter. The unreal has no being. The real never ceases to be. Those find the end of the quote, those final lines are like a sort of, like a motto for the fourth way work. Uh, the unreal has no being, but the real never ceases to be. And those words are written uh, on Orage's tombstone. And when Gurdjieff received news that Orage had died, he said that I've lost my closest essence friend. Uh, and people came to him to console him in a conventional manner and we're so sorry about Orage has died and isn't it terrible and so on. And Gurdjieff got a little bit upset and he said, no, 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 stop mouthing sort of platitudes and banalities. How do you know what's happened to Orage? How do you know where he is? I don't want to hear any more of this. And in no uncertain terms, he told them to go away. He said, go, please go away from me. And there's that wonderful quote in chapter one of Beelzebub's Tales, the, Ar Tales, the Arousing of S Thought, where Gurdjieff's grandmother actually dies and everyone is mourning and tearful. And Gurdjieff goes as a little boy, he's about 10 or 11, 
he actually goes to the gravestone and he dances on it and he sings songs she with the upturned toes may she with the saints repose la 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 and he says i danced and i danced around my grandmother's grave why not why not as he said about orage uh, you don't know what has happened to him we have this conventional view oh the person has died uh, how terrible and Gurdjieff wasn't having any of that and it's strange Gurdjieff himself has said the impetus and the motivation to write the third and final part of all and everything life is real only then when I am was actually given by by Orage's death he had Gurdjieff actually says that the death of Orage actually prompted me to write the third of the All and Everything series. So in many, many ways, it's a homage and a very, very glorious one to Alfred Richard Orage and everything that he represented and the work that he did. I will conclude this, this little biography about Orage with a quote from Charles Stanley Knott, who was with Orage in London when he actually, when both of them, in fact, came back from Fontainebleau to live in London. And it's a really, really beautiful quote. Quote, this is C.S. This is C.S. Nort uh, talking of an, a, a time he spent with Orage, in fact, a week before Orage died. Quote, we were discussing the translation and revision of Beelzebub's tales whilst walking up Chancery Lane in the city of London. Chancery Lane is by the Bank of England and the, the Tower of London, the financial district. Uh, uh, we were on our way home. It was the end of October 1934. Then the, the, then the talk came round to our time spent in Fontainebleau and our friends in New York. Suddenly, he turned to me, Orage, and said, you know, I thank God every day of my life that I met Gurdjieff. A week later, he was dead. End of the CS not quote. And a lot of people have said this about Gurdjieff for the time that was spent with him. It was like a, an, an epiphany and it was something utterly extraordinary. The energy that he gave off and, and his presence and the the knowledge combined with being that he had uh, was absolutely humongous. It was ginormous. Uh, and once one has been with someone like that, the memory would never go away. It stays and it's real. And with regards memory and recollection, and I'll, I'll, I'll actually give this to Orage and the people who have apparently passed away who were doing the work at Fontainebleau, and I just found it by chance. And it's one of the most, I was doing my revision for this talk earlier today, and I just found it completely by chance, and it fits in with everything that I've just shared with you. And it's a quote from that very, very large, voluminous uh, Remembrance of Things Past by Marcel Proust. And it's from volume one, Swan's Way, or Within a Budding Grove. And it's about, it's about essence and recollection very very purple prose and long-winded as Proust tends to be uh, but it's very very beautiful quote but when from a long distant past nothing subsists after the people are dead after the things are broken and scattered taste and smell alone more fragile but more enduring more unsubstantial more persistent more faithful remains poised for a very long time in our souls remembering waiting hoping amidst the ruins of the, of all the rest and bear unflinchingly in the tiny, in the tiny and almost impalpable drop of our essence, the vast structure of recollection. 
That's freaking awesome. Proust was, was the dog's bollocks, which is an English expression, meaning nothing could be better. Proust, it's not very, very literary and, you know, and uh, fancy and so on, but it's as, as it is. Uh, I read Proust's Remembrance of Things Past as a young man in my early 20s, uh, and it like creates a, a super sensual world, uh, which is actually realer than the one that we apparently inhabit. But I, but I love that quote, and I'll, I'll share it with you. The, the, ta the tiny drop of our essence and the vast structure of recollection. And we can apply that to Orage and to, to the work that he did with Gurdjieff and to all the people who have been involved in this very, very beautiful work. And it's still ongoing to this very, very day. And it's still alive and vital and it's breathing and it's awesome and it's life transforming. Uh, I know that from the people I work with and from my own development, evolution within the work. The structure of a vast recollection. I was going to read you uh, one of Orage's lectures. No, that would, that would make it too long. It's about a 30 minute lecture. It's about economizing energy. Uh, I don't even know where it is. Uh, as the chair creaks and creaks. Uh, hang on a minute. No, no, I, 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 forgive me. I will do it another time because that would take the video to an hour uh, and I think we have enough to absorb because new people who come to me have no idea who A.R. Orage is. Uh, they, they don't even know who Stanley Knott is, which is understandable. And I have to, at times, I have to be very careful because if I go into the, into the depths of Beelzebub's tales and bring all the neologisms out, uh, it really, really easily puts people off. Uh, and I released a video, I think last week sometime, about, about Morris Nichol speaking about the first and, conscious, and the second conscious shock. And this is very, very hard going for someone who is just coming into the work. So my aim now for the rest of my life is to share this work with other people who are able to receive it and who are sincere with it. There may not be many, that doesn't matter. It's got nothing to do with, as in all things, uh, quality above quantity. The quantity is irrelevant. It's the quality of what we do and the, the results of the work that we do upon ourselves and with other people. Uh, but A.R. Orage is one of the piv pivotal figures. He was basically Gurdjieff's right-hand man for, for 10 years. And when he came back to London and he passed away, away most of Gurdjieff's work was done with Jean de Salzman, with the movements and with the, uh, with the work on life is uh, real only then when I am. Uh, so there's like a, a progression from Orage to Jean de Salzman, and there is a lineage which, and then it went on to Michel de, Sal de Salzman, the son of Gurdjieff and Jean de Salzman, and there is a lineage which con used, continues today. Uh, uh, that I have no doubt at all. Uh, A.R. Orage, he wrote something called uh, Love and Other Psychological Exercises. And it's a very, very, there's a very beautiful quote in there. And if there's a certain gentleman watching from Hampstead, who uh, I think he's a, a doctor, like Morris Nichol himself, and he, he's mentioned A.R. Orage to me a number of times, but he says he's not interested in the fourth way, but I think he's telling Porky Pies, which is Cockney rhyme in slang for lies. Porky Pies, Pies, Lies, which is an East End London uh, vernacular language of its own. Instead of saying the word, you say a word that rhymes with it, me old China, China plate mate. Uh, and there's dictionaries written about them, about, well, about it, about Cockney rhyme in slang. Uh, up the apples and pears, up the stairs. Very, very nice to be in a country where English began. It may not have lasted here, but it began here, along with Geoffrey Chaucer in the 1300s, and then followed on by Shakespeare and so on and so forth. And uh, the history to the langu language and the depth of it is absolutely extraordinary. So that was Cockney rhyme in slang. And I'm going off on a tangent now. Uh, but yes, I, I must be 
aware not to sort of overwhelm people with it because you can have people I've met people who have been in the work for six months and have grasped it their essence is connected to it they know it they've been in six months and I've seen people who've been involved with 30 years they haven't got the faintest idea at all it's just all in their the formatory part of their intellectual center and in their imagination one can see it it's like the last video about René de Mol. If you've ascended the mountain and you've seen, you've actually seen for yourself, when you come down, you can separate the false from the real. And if we are able to do, do that, we are able to experience a great, great beauty and a great, great love. Oh. And from my last 30 years of involvement, the connection to, in inverted commas, to something else, is freaking extraordinary. Either a person enters your life and they have knowledge which is not of the normal kind, or you experience something which is not of the normal kind, and it alters your being. And this is where this work is at, being. I work with a number of people who are firmly in their intellectual analytic, analytical side of their, of, their, of their three parts, emotional, body and intellectual, uh, and they've all got to be harmonised, and especially the awakening of the emotional centre and the sensing of the body. I read today that Gurdjieff was speaking uh, about in Beelzebub's Tales, chapter 29, I've forgotten the title, the uh, Fruits of Former Civilizations, that the, the sensing of the body, of a body part, my neck, my chin, my hand, my legs, my chest, whatever, combined with an emotional awareness will lead to self-remembering. It's got nothing to do with intellect. It's the body and sensing it and sensing a force coming into you from above which aligns the three being parts into a total, total harmony. And the name for this in Gurdjieffian neologisms is Iramzam Keep. Iramzam, Iramzam Keep. I bring all my parts together, my three brains, my intellectual, my emotional, and my bodily brain. I bring them all together. Iramzam Keep. I will, everything happens obviously, but I will attempt to read the orage for you about bringing the three centres together and economising energy. I have notebooks, I actually write essays about the work uh, and I have plans for new videos and so on and it's all piled, piled up on my writing desk uh, and sometimes something can get lost in translation and it just disappears so, but I will do my best to read for you and talk about the economizing of energy and the bringing together of three centers by A.R. Orage. It will be next on the menu. Salute and lots and lots of love to you and that's conscious love. Thank you. This is Noel wishing you a very, very beautiful evening. Thank you very much now. Bye.